All right, um, hello everyone. My name is Christine Wolf. I'm a PhD candidate in the informatics department at UC Irvine. And I'm really happy to be here today. Um, we've already heard so many great talks this morning um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the ethnographic work I've done over the last two years, looking at the impact of data analytics on everyday work. In this talk, I'll focus specifically on a case of a smart email client to offer us some materials to think about data and algorithmic power. To begin, I wanted to kind of situate my talk within the conference's theme of data power, um, and particularly this panel's theme around algorithmic power, and start with a kind of opening point of departure, um, a question that I kind of sort of find myself asking over and over again um, in approaching questions around computer-supported cooperative work uh, and technologies in the workplace. And that is, you know, what is new? What's different about what's going on in this current cultural moment? And what's, what's the same? What hasn't changed? We speak often of big data, but data hasn't but data has long been an integral part of organizational life, particularly since the advent of scientific management. And similarly, we speak of algorithms and algorithmic operations, yet workflow, um, sorry, this, okay. Um, yet workflow and process diagrams have long been uh, part of the workplace and firm planning, um, particularly uh, in the, the since the advent of scientific management. In thinking about algorithmic power, today in this talk, I'm going to examine the changes occurring not only by introducing algorithms into new arenas, um, but also the change of so-called dumb or static algorithms to smart and dynamic ones. In doing so, I hope to show the potential these kinds of changes have to reconfigure situated practice and social relationships in the workplace. <coughs> Before I get into my specific software case, I wanted to briefly mention uh, my empirical study. Uh, this talk draws on a 15-month 15, 15 ethnographic field study at a large global technology and consulting corporation. My focus there was inductive and exploratory, broadly understanding the organizational changes taking place around the development and introduction of analytics into everyday workplace um, software like email, chat, and messaging. And also as a, a note, all names that I talk about are, are pseudonyms. This now brings me to the central case I'm focusing on today, the case of smart email. Used in this sense, smart mm. is meant to refer to various artificial intelligence, computational techniques applied to the management of personal email. Spam filtering is one aspect of this. All right, email is about correspondence, but so much more. Uh, it's a way of managing our product, projects, our products, our relationships, our workload. It's a way of managing ourselves. So efforts to reinvent email and make it smart then offer us a case to understand the implications of algorithmic changes, particularly on relational and social dimensions of our daily practice. At the beginning of my ethnographic study, this organization that I was embedded with was rolling out a new smart email client. This was a shift from a standalone client that this organization had used for almost 30 years. So think about Outlook or Airmail, a kind of standalone client. And they were shifting from this to a web-based interface that we're much more familiar with in Gmail uh, and similar uh, applications. There was one major change between the existing email client and the new one, is that the new one introduced uh, what I'm gonna focus on today. It involves sorting and filtering features. The new client eliminated the ability to create customized rules for sorting and filtering emails. Instead, the program was designed around a logic of search, over sorting, and also offered a bar <coughs> <clears throat> at the top of the screen that listed your trending contacts. Users were able to pin a contact that they wanted to stay up there, um, but otherwise the rest of the list was dynamic and algorithmically changed based on your communication patterns. So if you um, included a screenshot here just to kind of give you a sense of like what this looked like and how this offers a very dramatic difference from an Outlook-based experience. Um, with this bar at the top, dynamically changing as uh, the days 
your week goes on, um, and a red um, dot indicating whether you have a new message from that user. Here we can see how these changes were described in the new client's onboarding materials. The new client will analyze your mail and put suggestions for important and recent people at the top of the window. You can move people from the right section, automatically generated, <coughs> to the, le the left section, which are pinned contacts that you label yourself by dragging with your mouse. As well as being a useful and quick way to filter emails from your important people, they will flag automatically in the mobile app and for those with an Apple Watch, you will get new, cli new client alert taps to let you know when they emailed you. So not only is it a visual component, but it directly relates to the notifications you're gonna be getting. So you won't get a notification for every email, only if someone is up on that top bar. <coughs> a strategic project manager on the new client elaborated on the design logics in an interview with me, explaining, with the new client, we also look at kind of some analytics under the covers. You know, over the course of the last week or two, have you got a lot of emails from a specific person? Or do you tend to send a lot of emails to somebody specific? So that's one kind of concept to think about is how can you leverage, how can we leverage to better understand the user, kind of almost present to them what we think is probably most important for them based on their usage. And then skipping to the, to the bottom portion here. At the end of the day, you know, man, if I woke up in the morning and on my device, like I saw, I got 50 new emails, and then new client was able to tell me, hey, these are the emails that you got that are really important. Um, you know, we're trying to help the user have an easier time telling what is important and needs to be read quickly. It's clear this change was motivated by a desire to m make things better and easier for users to help them handle their email. And indeed, many users I spoke with found it useful. My intent is less about pointing to this feature as a particular UX evaluation, but instead to examine it more closely for insights into data and algorithmic power. So this brings me to two points uh, that I wanna discuss in this talk um, that generated from this case, an understanding algorithmic transformation which is obscuring the site and nature of data engagements, and two, asserting exogenous logics of signification. And I will get into each of these in order. To understand how the new client is changing the user's engagement with data, we need to understand what sorting and feature filtering used to look like. The old client offered extensive customization options outlined here in a user manual, step-by-step -step guide to customizing your inbox. Which we can also see in action here through a screenshot that I wanted to provide to give you guys a sense of how kind of elaborate um, these variables could get in customizing your sorting rules. And again here, more of the options. The old email client also allowed users to create customized coloring rules based on the sender. In making the change from the old client to the new, some users felt the shift from static roles they, could, they would have to create to the dynamic roles the program would automatically generate as a relief, as we can see here in a form uh, post on the company's internet from David. One thing that used to give me too much anxiety before was trying to address every single e email in the old client, classifying it and putting it in the appropriate folder so I'd be able to find it later in the case needed. But the overhead to do this usually far outweighs the expected result. And in the rest of the quote, you can kind of read how he's talking about the new client and how he, he finds this feature to be um, less overhead in his words. But on the other hand, the shift was also a loss of power. So as we can see in Rachel's experience, the opposite of David's relief, where she says, in an interview with me, I find myself really missing the sorting and filtering options in the old client. Maybe that sounds silly, or maybe I'm just a control freak, but I had it really dialed in, you know? Every email that came in would be organized based on the client and the project I was working on. I'd put them into folders and have different colors for everyone on the team. And then if something was left in the inbox, I knew it didn't fit, or maybe it was important or different from my routine emails somehow. 
I wanted to include both of these quotes to give a sense of the diversity of users' reactions to the new client and highlight how this isn't a matter of good software design or features versus bad ones, but rather a change that lets us reflect on the reconfiguration of relations around data engagements. What it offers us is insight into a shift taking place, a shift from direct engagements with data structures, setting up and defining various rules, working directly with and around emails, data structures to collaboratively organize or dial in one's email, to indirect engagements mediated by dynamic learning algorithms who interject their own <coughs> claims of relevance and importance. This change also raises questions of the nature of the relations implicated in algorithmic entanglements. A reconfiguration of burden or overhead, to use David's words, or what Rachel called dialing in, to one of reliance, receiving or consuming the outputs provided by the interface. This takes me to the second point I want to make, which is thinking about how this shift from static to dynamic algorithms also involves the assertion of exogenous logics of signification on everyday practice. The dynamic nature of the trending contacts ribbon at the top was a site of sense making for many users as they acclimated to the new client, trying to figure out what impacts um, which clients were displayed. Like we can see here, users discussing um, on a form. What algorithm does the new client use to pick the important people that go on the top, Nancy asks. I don't know the full details, but I think frequency and recency of communication with a contact are factored in, Peter. And then Matthew chimes in, okay, I had to laugh at your post, because Nancy had said, I'm kind of stuck with, with five unremovable profiles staring at me through their airplane windows, <laughs> was the word she used. To which, they, to which Matthew responded, well, I sure hope I don't become someone's unremovable. While there wasn't a firm explanation of the ribbon's sorting logics, there was a growing consensus among users that the ribbon was mostly based on frequency, how frequently you've emailed the contact, with a temporal component, how recently you've interacted with them. And while frequency and time may be reasonable registers of mathematical significance, patterns that smart algorithms can easily learn from users, these parameters are not always an indicator of importance or significance as defined in actual work practice. We can see an example of this in experience Cynthia shared with me in an interview. A frequent and recent contact on her ribbon was really just a one-off type of interaction that left her kind of confused. So she says, I still don't know how these things are computed. I did not pin in any important people. So I like the little faces, but I'm not using them at all right now. I don't know how they change. Yes, I have no idea. I think they're looking at people I communicated with most recently. But they recognize these people as being people I talk to. And this person, as she leaned over and pointed to the screen during our interview, I talked to her a lot in the last two or three days. But it was about a purchase order for some equipment. I never talked to her before, and I don't think I'll talk to her much in the future. But she keeps coming up on my important people for this week just because we had a conversation in the last two or three days. We can see a similar mismatch of sorting logics in an interview with Natalie. She works on one or two big projects a year, so she's emailing the same handful of people on her team all the time. Again, the, the register of frequency and <coughs> recent temporal uh, constraints don't really capture importance as it manifests itself in their teamwork. I guess it's kind of fun, she means, referring to the, to the ribbon, but it's not all that useful. I'm talking to the same people over and over, so you know I don't know that I really use it all that much. So in wrapping up, I'll return to the two main themes I set out to explore in this talk. I don't really have any big, uh, bold conclusions. This is still very much a work in progress, but I hope it has provided an empirical grounding from which we can more 
fully uh, interrogate the power of algorithmic transformations in reconfiguring organizational practice. So in, in the end, I'd like to thank you all for listening to me today, and also thanks to my lab and my generous sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, as you may see, my title has not changed, but my affiliation has. Uh, I'm now at the University of Montreal in the Department of Communication. I used to be in uh, political studies for 11 years. Um, this may come out in my background, or at least in my background may come out in my presentation. Um, this is also a work in, pro uh, a work in project, uh, progress, but also a joint project with a colleague of mine from criminology, Antonio Messel, who's now as we speak, he's giving a talk in Mexico, so he's not here today, but um, this, I want to lay out that this is part of a larger project, and I'll be presenting uh, one of these case studies that we have been underlying, and I'll lead you to that uh, in a few moments. Um, my work so far has been dealing with the national security state, um, especially security infrastructures that are often invisible or made invis invisible, and I wanted to make them visible. And in our digital context of ubiquitous surveillance, uh, raising the problems of algorithmic security or algorithms, all they work, it's not always an easy task. And this is our, our project tries to understand, I would say, the, the workings or uncovered workings of algorithmic security, the way that North American uh, borderlands are being governed and policed um, by looking at especially um, infrastructures, and in this very case, uh, algorithmic uh, infrastructures uh, do work. So in the talk, uh, if I'll be especially uh, addressing the, the last so the, on, the, on the left, uh, the, the right here, uh, the issue of financial intelligence. Uh, but as you'll see further down, uh, we have a broad uh, spectrum of uh, case studies that we're looking at trying to uncover how, I would say, the techno political infrastructure of North American uh, border security works. Um, Thinking about how mobility, especially in, uh, well, ever since 9-11, but in recent years, uh, even more so, has been promoted as a, a value, uh, especially as being fundamental for uh, liberal societies, um, the way that security and mobility has been intersected uh, as seen uh, two trends emerging. So one, or the classic one, of trying to uh, enclose build walls, uh, and the other one would be more trying to uh, keep circulation um, possible to um, so manage flows, especially uh, the issue of free flows of, of trade information, uh, commercial routes, uh, data, uh, and especially after 9-11, the issue of smart borders has been used as the technological solutions to uh, making that happen, so making security, say, possible uh, while allowing or not preventing as much uh, the free flows of people, data, and um, things. Um, so in this paper, again, we are interested in the f policing of financial flows, especially to understand how people and data are governed through infrastructures of security, especially where algorithms are key infrastructures uh, to govern mobilities. Um, so just. This is like the, the big context, so especially in, since 9-11, the impact of Homeland Security, uh, especially the new border security context of smart border technologies, but especially uh, the way that data surveillance and especially big data has been used as a key component of governance. Um, so the key question for us is, well, how do algorithms actually interact with the North American border security process? So how do they work as, uh, how, how do they act? Uh, what do they do? Um, so in our work, we're trying to uh, assess and uncover uh, what security actors actually do and how they do design uh, these algorithms. So the part of uh, that is key with algorithms is that they are both infrastructures and part of infrastructures. Uh, they're, as you know, medical formulas set in computing system to identify, sort, um, accomplish procedures in a sequential manner, uh, data that act on other systems, uh, data that act through data, uh, and especially uh, they, the, 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 with algorithms, they recursively act uh, upon algorithms and other humans, and especially the, the key for us is because algorithms are usually deemed or rendered invisible in constitu constituents of the infrastructures, and I would say both digital and mobile, um, as well as physical, then 
getting a way to look at them, how do they work, especially through the bordering process uh, and securing and policing of North American borderlands uh, is a challenge. And that's what we're trying to achieve with that. So our work is especially building on, well, I see the inter uh, infrastructural turn social sciences, but especially uh, because we do a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, work that is interdisciplinary, uh, all these different, that I won't go into details, but especially mobility studies. We do especially surveillance and security studies, but especially uh, more recently, the critical media infrastructures work uh, that has made um, uh, or emphasize uh, the political life of infrastructures, especially as they relate to media. Um, so the different way that we can, and I won't go into lens, but just I just want to add a bit of the understanding we have of infrastructures, but I just want at least to highlight um, the importance for us is to understand infrastructures as something that is relational, um, something that is especially part of human organizations, evolving, uh, certainly not static, and infrastructures are especially key in that context, and especially through the work of John Durham Peters and others like Ned Rossiter, to understand and use um, algorithms uh, as they could be conceived as logistic uh, logistical media, um, we're able to understand how infrastructures really set the terms of operation. And it quote, um, uh, Durham Peters here, the job of logis logistical media is to organize and orient, to arrange people and property, often into grids. They both coordinate and subordinate, arranging relationships uh, among people and things. So to think about algorithms and security is uh, already brings to fore the issue of infrastructures and the, thus our assumption in this paper, in this presentation, is really to look at how infrastructure acts, uh, using especially Keller Easterling work, uh, as a medium, uh, as, as even infrastructure as a space, um, especially that has been the, main, the point of contact and access between us all, the rules governing the space of everyday life. Others have used uh, uh, this similar understanding, Lauren Berlin especially, but uh, what is really important for us in trying to uh, in our case study, especially as you'll see, trying to understand how the infrastructure, so the algorithms, uh, act as a medium of information, uh, a, a platform uh, that manages uh, information, so flows, but especially how it is being used and designed to, uh, well, to do some triage of information, to sort out, um, especially because we often rely on infrastructures knowing that they do some things, but not necessarily, uh, necessarily easy to see, uh, to visualize what they actually do. Uh, but as part of our challenge to try to make this uh, effort uh, of being uh, rendering it visible, to make visible infrastructures, uh, that for us is like the connection, the link between uh, making governing uh, of mobilities, uh, and especially uh, the, the management of people moving data, moving flows of data, uh, uh, possible. So there are many ways that just trying to get, make this more visible. Uh, metaphors, the, the the haystack metaphor, especially of where you know, algorithms are supposedly uh, making possible the connecting of the dots. If you've heard, especially with security specialists, um, it remains part of the the challenge. Uh, there's always a challenge. Sorry, uh, the challenge of the, uh, invisibility remains uh, powerful. Um, and certainly there are, and that would probably be me more bit being a skeptical here, uh, algorithmic power may not necessarily be as, um, let's say, um, efficient or, um, let's say, powerful as we sometimes think that it is, especially uh, the way that, that, that security agents uh, and especially state uh, decision makers uh, think that they are. And just, that's, oh, sorry, just, I just wanted to highlight here, just making visible something of a challenge. Just This is just the way that the Department of Land Security has tried to visualize the border security process, uh, just trying to understand the different points of crossing points and different and technologies involved and processes, just thinking that's supposedly the infrastructures involved in the border security process, uh, again, in, in and of itself, is part of a challenge. And when it comes to thinking about that and uh, algorithms, uh, well, there's a seeming an additional challenge that we have to understand the media ecology of algorithms, uh, the way that they are especially being used in many ways, especially when it comes to security and policing, uh, as predictive uh, predictive tools, especially with the effect of predictive policing has been uh, more popular in recent years, especially with the police departments. Um, 
and other security agencies. Uh, so what we want, to, we want to do with this is when you look at in algorithmic infrastructures as both part and, uh, part and parcel of governance as logistical media, so it's really trying to understand how in the practice, so the logics of where logistic governs, uh, to try to understand how the, these algorithms are uh, made possible, are they are designed, what they're supposed to be achieving, um, and this is where we turn to uh, the work especially of Ned Rossiter as logistical media. So where logical, logistical media as technologies and infrastructure and software um, coordinate, capture, control the movement of people, finance, and things. So especially when infrastructure makes world, logistics governs them. Um, uh, the way that we try to uh, understand and apply this um, in, uh, in our work is the way to think about the three clusters that we have highlighted for work. So let's say it's such a bit, a bit bigger than that, but the, the, the security mobility nexus of algorithmic security, uh, especially that centers on the users, of the users of algorithmic security being all the security agents, but also the, f the different private firms and public um, officials, uh, but, but even us as I individuals, tra as um, mobile travelers, uh, as citizens. Um, the infrastructure is in and of itself, so try to understand it and, and uncover what it, what it is and how it works, and, and especially uh, the effects, the producing effect of these infrastructures of security uh, when they actually work. So when, that's when I highlighted that algorithms are both infrastructures and part of, and they are data, working through data and with data. So we've applied that to, especially in our work with trying, and this is really the beginning, the six cases, uh, the challenging one, but th we have certain accesses that are secured, so will be the algorithmic security industries. But for today, I just want to highlight uh, one aspect of it is the financial surveillance one. Um, well, and I'll know I have seven minutes left. So just highlight the problem, so the stack metaphor that I mentioned earlier, so this is one bank compliance officer, because when it comes to uh, financial surveillance, uh, and especially financial intelligence, um, the, with big data, uh, well, comes the, the, the especially ever since 9-11, uh, anti-money laundering and especially anti-terrorism policies have mandated uh, bank officers and especially to follow and track uh, suspicious uh, financial activities. Uh, and so there is a huge amount of data and the idea is that, well, it cannot be all processed by uh, human actors. So in light of this, so the, and this is based a lot of uh, this, case it is based on more than 30 interviews with uh, financial uh, banking uh, compliance officers and uh, especially analysts uh, from the uh, Canada's FinTrack, so the Financial Intelligence Unit of Canada. Uh, what is of interest for us in this context is just to highlight the different, uh, let's say, um, activities that are being rendered uh, under financial intelligence. So yes, the daily surveillance of financial flows the detection and denunciation of suspicious transactions, and especially more recently, the algorithmic devices, so the suspicious activity monitoring devices that have presented, and this is where you see a discrepancy in the, and this is just looking at Canada's standpoint, um, discrepancy between what has been done and what has been, or what is being hoped that to be achievable at some point, uh, because these are, so th these, uh, new tactics, uh, uh, so where the banks are required to act as suspecting machines for, uh, well, for the state, for, for, for FinTrack, for instance, uh, when they have to report these suspicious activities, like I said. Uh, well, first of all, the banks, their interests, well, they first, their reputation always counts, so even though they're, there's an avalanche of information that they have to track and monitor, uh, they, they have to try to find ways of being able to sort that, uh, and this is really through algorithms that they've been able to do that, but um, this is also a case that it is becoming more um, of a technical challenge on what is being made really possible. Uh, the technical challenge being especially that uh, first it costs more money, uh, and but they also want to avoid sanctions from the state if they do not report, uh, and especially if there's a reputational damage, uh, and also but they, they, they want to make money, they're banks, after all. Uh, so there's a normalizing effect that banks business uh, with this financial surveillance uh, requirement, uh, where banks have been more and more um, involved in uh, designing uh, 
well, I'll, I'll do it, make a financial big data surveillance. Uh, so really, to try to produce a huge amount of uh, well, data uh, sorting that has created over time uh, a lot of false positive. And anyone who's worked with uh, and, uh, big data, and especially with algorithms, uh, especially from the security standpoint, um, the false positives is, is a well-known problem, uh, but it comes at a certain cost, in a sense. When you look at, and this is taken from uh, one of these uh, bank compliance officers, so of all the alerts that are produced from the, thank you, um, these, uh, the, 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 these, these, uh, these, Suspicious, uh, suspicious activity monitoring. Uh, only five to ten percent of alerts are actually turning to cases, and out of these cases, uh, only one percent will probably be a real positives. Um, but the problem is that they do have to go through all of those alerts, uh, and this is really a time-consuming uh, work, labor. Um, again, it's also very costly. They want to keep keep a balance of. Uh, what they want to be able to do, in a sense being efficient, but also what they're really uh, able to achieve. Um, and this is where the complex, uh, we, we see the complex algorithmic process of algorithms as logistical media that govern data, while well, also understanding that this is a human, non-human assemblage. This is uh, the technical uh, infrastructure, uh, technopolitical infrastructure in which the algorithm is embedded. and. Alert, they do not simply pop up. Um, they are a result of multiple social technical arrangements of techn technological and human actors that configure agency and action. Um, there are, and especially as soon as you do um, make a choice, uh, you have to stick with the way that the, 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 the solution, especially the technological solution that you've been able to afford. Uh, so the vendor sells you a specific algorithmic device, and then uh, you have to find a way to make it more efficient, to, to be able to well, re, re, have, have less and less uh, false positive uh, and make, be <laughs> coming at a certain cost. Um, and this, and this comes from the more, uh, the, the, the balance with the security context here is that also algorithms, they promise again, they, 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 they promise a, a, a lot of positive, uh, and especially there's a lot of hope uh, with their hues, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily able to efficiently, um, let's say, mix with uh, what would be called a more human hunches, especially when it comes to uh, who are the people who have been at the source of these fin uh, suspicious financial transactions. Uh, and this is really where a limit comes in and the, where the human factor uh, is still there, cannot always be predicted by scenarios, and that's where, that's why all these alerts have to be uh, individually uh, looked at, uh, and again, with it, which comes at a certain cost, uh, and especially it is very time consuming. So, in conclusion, and th this is what we're trying to achieve with our work, is well, we need to understand how predictive policing works, how it's done, and especially the labor that is uh, required and mobilized. Um, it is also a very speculative security. It is based on calculations, predictions, it's an actual logic. Um, so we have to understand that, and that's why the ecology of algorithms, and quoting here uh, Rob Kitchen, uh, we must think critically about algorithms as, quote, algorithms cannot be divorced from the conditions under which they are developed and deployed. What, it, that, what this means is that algorithms need to be understood as relational, contingent, contextual in nature, framed within the wider context of their socio-technical assemblage. From this perspective, algorithm is one element in broader apparatus, which means it can never be understood as a technical objective in partial form of knowledge or mode of operation, which often case is and uh, when it comes to the, their use, and especially their implementation in security policies, uh, and the change with data surveillance today, uh, of which I would say the algorithmic security surveillance assemblage is a, a quintessential example, that is does not simply describe things, it produces, it prescribes, and especially it, their decisions are taken on these calculations. It's not on what has to be is being done. Uh, and this is why we must speak of this era as being one of speculative security. Uh, and this is why you must pay close attention to the labor involved in algorithmic or financial intervention, uh, surveillance, sorry. Um, because, and then what? Yeah. And, and this is why algorithms are not doing everything yet. They're still in very force. Again, this, this important division of labor between human and non-human. Uh, and 
this is very much part of the infrastructural technology that acts in the background in the visi in visibility and to remove the input of human agents at the border or in this case at the banks uh, produce an illusory uh, an illusory more objective um, security process uh, and like our work is just trying to at least try to uh, dig a bit further than that than the promise of algorithms thank you Um, we're going to talk about um, a subject which probably perplexes everybody in this room. What is the derivatives market and do we care? And what, one of the things that I'm going to start with is not my work. It's a beautiful infographic which I found online. And, um, and it's really sort of like brought to home what the whole subject is about. And, it re and, and usually, I'm, because I'm a physicist, we just go around measuring things, you know, the size of things and, you know, what signals and things. So this really appealed to me, this infographic, because it was looking at the size of different parts of um, the global economy. And I really wanted to share it with you. Um, but we might just, I might just go to the website and show it. Yeah, might have to do but on this just, one. Yeah, we yeah. can do that. And, and there were a, th a few other things which I spent hours creating. So I'll just talk to you about them. Yes. yes. If when you're at home, in the comfort of your homes, you go to Google and you look at the visual, um, this, look at this money, money Project website. It's a really clever website. They produce these wonderful infographic visualizations. And every day you can look at a new sort of way of looking at the global economy and different, different things that preoccupy us as human beings on this earth. So what we would have seen from that infographic would have been the size of the current size of the derivatives market with respect to everything else in the world, with respect to global deficit, with respect to um, the world's GDP. And um, what you would see is that, the, that the, as of December 2016, the value of the global outstanding derivatives contracts was reported as 135 trillion US dollars. That's several times the world's GDP. So the magnitude of the present-day derivatives market contrasts sharply with the early 1970s, when the modern-day derivatives market was, the bear, was largely illegal and other forms of derivatives were practically non-existent. I had another graph which showed the, how the derivatives market, there's an explosive ex shoot-up of the derivatives market. And um, so in this work, we're going we're to talk about how the explosive growth of the derivatives market over the last 30 years and the subsequent financialization of the global economy has been permissible due to the continued narratives of the scientific. The algorithms of financial modeling, such as the Black-Scholes equation in its many forms, have been sacralized and imbued with a reverence which prohibit critical analysis of both mathematical models and the financial instruments that they legitimize. It will be argued that this, this sacralization has occurred as a consequence of high modernity, where the endeavor for rationalization has been blurred by the capitalist impulse. Global finance is often seen as being abstract, unfathomable, beyond comprehension. The, and with the advent of algorithmic trading, which operates in a virtual ephemeral cloud, furthers this resemblance to a transcendent, transcendental entity. In this work, we extend this analogy by applying the methodologies of the secular study of religion. By examining the foundations of belief in an autonomous, rationally driven global financial market, we seek to pro problematize the collective failure to challenge both the epistemology and the legitimacy of the global derivatives market. The derivatives, so the big question is what is a derivative, what is the derivatives market? So it's, derivatives are essentially a composite of financial instruments. Um, the ones m most easiest to explain are the futures options. And um, so, so again, I had another infographic. And um, so how, how, the f how options work is that you, you should be able to predict the price of some asset that you hold. And you should be able to predict the price of that asset in the future. Maybe there are people here, financial people here. Yes, yes. No, okay. And so you should be able to predict the the, the price of your asset in the future, and you, then then you should be able to um, create a, an options contract and um, sell that options contract to somebody to say, okay, if the price of this goes down, I will give you the difference, or vice versa. So you either have a call or a put. Different types of options. 
And again, this is just jargon, this call, put, option, futures, swap. The underlying thinking behind it is very simple. It's very, very straightforward. And when you read um, textbooks on this subject, there, there's a famous one by MacDonald. That he, he tries to like sort of always gives, give you a rationale for why the derivatives market exists. And he draws the reader to safeguarding food, food production and food security by invoking a, like an agricultural example. So he talks about a, if you have a bushel of wheat and, and, and you know, you're a farmer, you're going you're gonna to grow some wheat and you, you're going to sell this bushel of wheat for $3 in the future. So you're gonna, you're, as a farmer, you're worried, you know, weather, you know, soil um, conditions, whatever, everything to, that's beyond your control. Farming is always precarious. So how do you safeguard your, 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 um, your income? And the way that they say, oh, the, with the help of the options market, with the help of the derivatives market. Because if you buy an options contract and say your, your crop fails, you will, be, you, will, um, have the dif you will be paid the difference of how much you would have earned because you've safeguarded it by this insurance of an option. And um, alternatively, if you, are, if you sell at a higher price, you will then give that, that you will then pay the person who owns the option, options contract the difference. So th this is it's meant to be this sort of built-in insurance into what you're doing. So the contract has reduced risk for both of you, he claims. So within this contractual, um, um, inherent within this contractual transaction, there are no transfer of assets. It's, it's just the ability to predict the price of the underlying asset, in which this case is wheat, over a time scale over a whole year. So the emergence of the modern derivatives market in the early 1980s has been attributed to, in much of the literature by variously positioned scholars, to the publication of the Black-Scholes equation. And, and so Fisher, Black, and Myron Scholes published the derivation of an options pricing model in 1973. And this was further elaborated by Robert Merton. And this equation has been described by many people and by one, one scholar, it's been described as the most famous f formula in financial economics. In fact, that whole subject splits, splits, splits decisively into pre-Black Scholes and post-Black Scholes. And so this equation is regarded as being like epoch changing, this one formula which I would have shown you. <laughs> and, and, and when you would have looked at this formula, you would have said, hey, that's just a partial derivative equation. You know, that's just sorry. That's just a partial differential equation. It's just a rate of change equation. Oh, if I dr if I sort of work on it a bit more, I will actually get the diffusion equation from physics. It's just that simple. It's got two terms, like one drift term and one sort of volatility term. And and yet this one equation, where everything is treated homogeneously, is meant to represent how um, financial markets operate. But there, are, but there are many assumptions under which this one equation, when you use this equation, you have to use it very quer carefully. And there are many, many assumptions underlying it. And the main one is that w what you're describing is like a Markovian process. So you're, sa you're saying that you can only predict in the immediate, from what the data you have right now, you're going to predict what's going to happen immediately next, not in one year's time. So the, the, time, um, the time interval over which you can predict is very, very small if you apply the, the equation in the way that it was intended. OK, so, so this, this equation, the perceived abilities to predict asset prices has allowed the formulation of the riskless portfolio, a portfolio which contains stocks of an underlying asset together with the options to hedge against changes in the asset prices. The appeal of derivatives is therefore apparent, and, and banks, national institutions, your pension funds, you know, nation states are all engaged in the derivatives market. However, historians of financial economics have unearthed evidence of derivative markets as early as the late, uh, late antiquity. And there are records of publications of sophisticated hedging methods, like, uh, which are similar to the modern system, like in the 1900s, in both in the United States and in England. So a trajectory has been mapped out of the evolution of financial mathematics, which exhibits like, you know, pe people lose the learning and then they relearn and they reformulate and, and the, the derivative markets re reappear. Many of the instrumental aspects of modeling a asset prices were present in the, early, in the works of Louis Bachelier in 1900 and Nelson in 1904. There is a rich history of cro cross fertilization of physics and economics dating back to Newton and Adam Smith. So the exact role, what is the exact role of this Black-Scholes equation in the emergence of the derivatives market? And, and it's highly contested and, and yet, 
banks, financial institutions, mainstream news media continue to propagate this single narrative of this powerful mathematical formula and that it's capable of generating gains. But if you use it incorrectly, it will cause a banking panic and it can cause large losses. So for, for this reason uh, on which, and others on which we should elaborate, the Bagshaw's equation, its social and ideological role in the derivatives market is key to legitimizing financialization of the, of the global economy. Okay. Um, so in order to understand how the Bagshaw's equation is upheld with such reverence, it is useful to consider it through a framework of an outsider discipline. Uh, we've chosen the work of religious studies scholar Anne Tave, specifically her writings on theory and method in the study of religion, using her concept of the special things. According to Tave, specialness is often used as an inscription in order to define the religious or the religious experience. However, she argues that religion and the religious, or the sacred, mystical, magical, numinous, spiritual, etc., are folk categories or abstractions, and scholars should instead refer to the things or building blocks that comprise a religious tradition, rather than speaking of it in phenomenological terms. She terms these building blocks as the special things, the things that give the perception of being set apart, whereas in reality, they are parts that can be analyzed in terms understood concretely. And so this is what we intend to do with the Black-Scholes equation. Uh, we argue that the, the Black-Scholes equation is upheld and, um, and continually used because it is deemed special, all-knowing, irrefutable, and without question. This is problematic for many reasons, some of which we will address in this paper. In order to problematize the, this equation by extension derivatives markets, it is useful to break down its specialness into the special things that make it socially, politically, and ideologically powerful. The special things, we argue, are its scientistic characteristics, that it is derived straight from a physics equation and that, that derivation somehow gives it more legitimacy. The rhetoric of uh, financial um, entities that comprise a narrative of accuracy and irrefutability, or as we'll term it, sort of performing belief, um, which thus mystifies its dangerous instability and the consequences therein, and the complexity of the the complexity of the derivatives market that complicates investment behaviors, or at least the perceived complexity of it, and the real life consequences of its application. Um, keeping in mind that um, we are using uh, this concept as a more of a heuristic in sort of our methodological approach, but we will also touch on other theories from religious studies, uh, STS studies, and other social sciences. So the derivatives market has come to be seen as a natural component of the broad spectrum of financial instruments that constitute financial economics. Within such a narrative, the perceived ability to predict um, asset pricing is merely seen as an impetus for the growth of the derivatives market. That is, the derivatives market had existed since time immemorial, but now it is employed with more vigor following the newfound confidence in the ability to predict pricing due to advances in mathematics, information technology, and most notably the Bach-Scholes equation. So this is one narrative. In, so in, in, this, in this narrative, in this scenario, the Black-Scholes equation not only functions to guide trading and hedging, but it expresses an underlying behavior of the money markets. So in this vein, it is frequently stated that the Black-Scholes equation was discovered as it was a natural law waiting to be uncovered. <coughs> This effort to universalize and affirm the Black-Scholes equation as a natural law is very recent in, in, in as is the modern, modern derivatives market itself. Its origins lie in a concerted effort to scientific, scientification of financial economics. The mathematical formulation of the Black-Scholes equation itself and its derivation, which is treated as a mathematical proof, construct its appeal as rational scient as scientific instrument, which cannot be faulted when applied. In examination of the Black Scholes equation, one is immediately struck by its simplicity. Some have referred to it as an elegant simplicity. That a complex, heterogeneous, many modern problems such as the socio-economic, political, geopolitical, environmental, and meteorological conditions that influence asset and commodity prices can be reduced to a homogeneous diffusion equation does indeed appear to be highly simplistic. Although the inadequacies of the Black Scholes equation as a mathematical model have been explored in literature, and refined, modified versions of the, of the model have been developed, there is a continued relentless effort to pursue mathematical modeling, where varied methods of machine learning and the mathematics of, mathematical physics of complex systems are employed to harness their asset pricing predictive powers. This sacralizing process, elevating the mathematical, scientific, rational to above and beyond critical analysis, normalizes the activity of financial economics and the financial rentiers. 
The production of this normalization occurs through norm-related act speech, uh, speech acts, which make validity claims of the Black-Scholes equation. The outcome is that it legitimizes the options market, and this has been candidly recorded in an ethnographic study of the first options trading exchange in the modern period. So there's a work by this um, uh, extraordinary um, social theorist, um, Donald McKenzie, who um, um, studied the Chicago Exchange, um, ex Chicago Board Exchange, Options Exchange, sorry, I'm mixing my words up. And um, he interviewed um, a, a someone who was a, a form, a, like a, a, the council, a legal sort of um, council, and this person said, Black Scholes was really what enabled the exchange to thrive. It gave a lot of legitimacy to the whole notions of hedging and efficient pricing, whereas we were faced in the late 60s and early 70s with the issue of gambling. That issue fell away, and I think Black Shoals made it fall away. It wasn't speculation or gambling, it was efficient pricing. I think the Securities and Exchange Commission very quickly thought of options as a useful mechanism in the securities market, and it's probably, that's my judgment, the effects of Black Shoals. I never heard the word gambling again in relation to stock options and traded on the Chicago Board Exchange. So in other words, the trade is fitted to the equation. There is no natural law dictating the practice of hedging. According to Huang and Talib, these exchanges are, these exchanges are a rich craft with, with traders learning from traders and tricks developing under evolution pressures in, in a bottom-up manner. It is technique, not, not episteme. episteme. In other words, these exchanges are learned practices and so-called tricks of the trade that are carried out to conform to the Black-Scholes model. The Black-Scholes model does not actually inform these practices so much as provide a template. Huang and Talib continue, had, had it been a science, it would not have survived, for the empirical and scientific fitness of the pricing and hedging theories offered are, are, best, effective, are, are best effective and unscientific. Michel Callon proposed that the economy is bedded is embedded, sorry, not in society but in economics, where economics does not describe an existing external economy, but brings that economy into being. Uh, economics performs the economy, creating the phenomena it describes. That is, the behavior of the economy is not the expression of an underlying normativity or natural law, but is a consequence of performativity. According to Prada, financial markets can be seen as information processors, sending out price signals on the basis of which actors make their choices according to rational decision rules. Belief in the irrefutability of the derivatives market is engendered by a ritual participation on the part of financial firms who trade in options and in do so transfer risk from party to party. The risk is still present, but its mobility has the appearance of risk management. It is worth asking then, how much of this risk transfer practice has become so innate in financial management behavior that it has obfuscated the very fact that the risk itself is indeed still present. Borrowing from Edward Muir's work on ritual, so-called risk management can be classified as performing rituals as they are characterized by long histories of commonplace actions performed under watchful eyes until they, no longer, until they are no longer common but so exquisite, so appropriate in the moment, so precise in their details that they become precarious to execute. They have become ritual. Uh, financiers who become specialists in the derivatives markets execute their jobs repeatedly, transferring risk from party to party over the period of their careers performing their belief in risk management. As they work with hedgers, uh, they reassure their clients that setting up hedge funds will offset possible loss sets and other asset funds. Thanks. Um, of course, trades are not performed individually, as uh, Hag and Talib stated earlier, in our, or as we quoted earlier in our paper. Traders learn from other traders and ostensibly work with other traders. This strongly suggests processes of groupthink or group behavior. Donald McKenzie worked on a group, uh, oh, um, did we, this was from the uh, Guardian article? Did I? No, no, this is Donald McKenzie. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, Donald, Donald McKenzie, as we cited earlier, uh, who did do an, ethnogra an ethnography of Chicago option traders, uh, demonstrates um, how, traders copy. how traders copy other traders with actors instinctively conforming their practices to abide by a mathematical model such as a black Scholes equation. In a 2012 Guardian article, the mathematician Ian Stewart wrote, at the forefront of these efforts is complexity science, a new branch of mathematics that models the market as a collection of individuals interacting according to specified rules. These models reveal the damaging effects of the herd instinct. Market traders copy other market traders. It makes everything go belly up at the same time. If engineers took that attitude and one bridge in the world fell down, so would all the others. 
here Stewart strikes at the heart of the problem of this rational slash mathematical oriented performance of trading and exchanging. The persistent and ritual mimicry of traders by traders continually perpetuates the irrefutability of the black scholes Martin equation. And the myth that mathematical proofs and derivations constitute a rational law that, gun that undergirds the activities of, of derivatives markets. In reality, there is little to no critical examination of the legitimacy and ill effects of fitting an unstable practice into a mathematical model. In that case, it is worthwhile to call to question the agency of traders and markets vis-a-vis -vis the perceived agency of the Black-Scholes equation. Using Calon's com concept of socio-technical agencement, which is derived from um, the philosopher Deleuze, uh, his concept of agencement, uh, this concept refers to the distribution of agency through combined human and technological means. Uh, with which we can analyze how participation in the derivatives market and reliance on market al on these mathematical algorithms demonstrates agency, as though it has the ability to be controlled and manipulated with the interests and intentions of financial markets and their clients at the heart of these assemblages. The derivatives markets, uh, the derivatives markets have been analyzed as discursive assemblages, uh, uh, discursive assemblages form uh, of a collective of humans, technological devices, and algorithms. Uh, to quote uh, Nora Chetina and Preda, all traders on the floors have a range of technology at their disposal. Most conspicuously, to, uh, the up to five computer screens which display the market and serve to conduct trading. When traders arrive in the morning, they strap themselves in to their seats, figurative, figuratively speaking. They bring up their screens and they, and from then on, their eyes will be glued to these screens, their visual regard captured by it even when they talk or shout to each other their bodies, yes, uh, and the screen melting together in what appears to be total immersion in the action in which they are taking part. To conclude, we have sought to apply the methods of the secular study of religion to deconstruct the sacralization of the black Scholes equation and the reverence that shrouds the derivatives market. We did this by using religionist Antave's concept of, this, of special things or building blocks that ensure a more critical discussion that, that enable a more critical discussion of religion. For the purposes of this project, we ha have determined our own special things, special things categories for understanding and critiquing the reverence towards the Black Scholes equation. We discussed how naturalization discourses, process processes and performativity, ritual, groupthink, and agencement are the components which obfuscate this, uh, which are the components obfuscated by this reverence. We intend f to further this discussion by looking at its social utility and, and question the legitimacy of the Black Scholes and equation in the derivative market. Of course, it is worth asking and answering the question, what process does this kind of analysis serve? We think the pr purposes are multiple. For today, we wish to draw your attention to regulation and eventual deregulation of the derivatives market. After the stock market crash of 1929, there's a there's a a, re, a really good um, a really good graph. I love looking at graphs and data. Um, there's a really good graph which um, shows the number of bank crises against the oh, year. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, against the and um, <laughs> you can see I'll have to do it with my finger. You can see lots of structure, <laughs> and then it just drops down, nothing, and then structure again. So that period when there were no bank crises, that's the period we would like to relive, I think. And that period was in the post-war years, and when um, bank banking regulation was in force, and there was a, an agreement called the, the Bretton Woods Agreement, which is an international agreement of, I think, 44 nations, and, and heavy banking regulation was enforced, and, and it was a period of prosperity and and you know the new deal and things like that anyway so after the stock market crash of 1929 derivative markets were regulated for many decades essentially the kind of trading that is that is characteristic of this kind of market was made illegal to prevent future crashes with the advent and gradual incorporation of neoliberal ideology and thought presidents such as Nixon and Nixon was the one who repealed the um, withdrew from the Bretton Woods agreement Reagan and Clinton began to deregulate the markets. The gradual erosion of regulations since the Bretton Woods Agreement marks the beginning of the decades-long process of deregulation that has undermined the protections and purposes of market regulation. Asking us to stop. 
That's, well, that was about it. Because that was more or less about it, so, <laughs> yes. We're sorry. Yeah.